Hello and welcome to Green Fleet Talks. My name is Kate Armitage and I'm your host for our discussion today. I'm delighted to be joined by Chris Fower, who is Sales and Marketing Director at Fisher Panda. Hi, Chris. Hi, Kate. Nice to meet you. Nice to um, meet you too. So today, Chris and I are going to be discussing the transition to electric fleets, uh, some of the barriers to adoption and the crucial role that government must play. Um, but first, Chris, um, would you be able to tell me a little bit more about Fisher Panda and the role that they are playing in the journey for the decarbonisation of transport? Sure. Well, uh, thanks for having us today. Um, yeah, so Fisher Panda UK, we're a uh, UK-based family-run business um, said we've been trading now for nearly 30 years. Um, we're, spe we're spread across a lot of industries, primarily um, marine, specialist vehicle and defence. Um, and a very long-standing pedigree in all things power and energy management related. Um, it, it's specifically in the automotive market where we're heavily specialised in onboard auxiliary power systems, um, mainly relating to payload power um, and that's really our, our offering to the market is really coming up with smart innovative um, power-based systems to to offer um, vehicle individual vehicles or fleets of vehicles um, effective power systems right and can you give so um, can you give me an example of the types of vehicles that you're you're running this auxiliary power for it's typically more um, specialist, so it can range from command and control, um, blue lights, um, right up to utility vehicles, work vans. It's it's quite varied. Basically, anything that needs power, auxiliary power in, to, to run civic equipment, we can come up with a solution. Um, the, the Fisher Panda as a brand is more known for diesel generators. That's where the company started. But we're, we're almost going for our own transition as a business um, with with the transition towards greener technologies and and some of that we'll just i'm sure we'll discuss today okay well that helps me massively uh, and i know that um uh, diesel generators are, in themselves are are quite a big problem in this whole decarbonization um journey that we're on so um so i wanted to ask you chris um, for fleets that have not started their decarbonisation journey, what interim options can uh, LCV fleet operators consider before full electrification becomes possible for them? Yeah, I think in truth, it's um, more, more trying to have a holistic approach to, to the wider range of fleets. Um, I think it becomes quite apparent now that, that there isn't really a, a one, one fits all type solution. Um, and it's about really our encouragement would would more be relating to um, fleet managers analysing user profiles and and their actual user um, the demands of the vehicles in day to day usage. Um, obviously, our niche and our offering is more on power based systems, so that that clearly then links into um, into the auxiliary aspect of vehicles and and how that equipment can be run. Um, but it is more more a, a sort of holistic view, um, and that's really what we start off with, sort of an early encouragement. Um, Chris, uh, what are your views on the current electric infrastructure, and what role does hybridisation play in that? Um, yeah, absolutely. There's there's no there's no doubt that the pace um, of the of the demand is increasing. Um, my only concern about the infrastructure at the moment is potentially the, the deficit that that could be from the actual See, obviously increasing amounts of EVs to the actual infrastructure quality that's being put out. Um, and that there has its own challenge. Uh, I think there needs to be um, you know, some serious thought process to how we can um, eat into that deficit because as EV sales continues to grow, um, yes, the infrastructure is being improved, but um, it's, it's the rate of that growth is what is, is inevitably going to lead to a catch up. Um, and that's that there is really the challenge that and, and really my my opinion on, on that on that question 
Okay, yeah. I mean, I think uh, there definitely has been uh, a, a crunch, a critical crunch, maybe 12 months ago, where the number of vehicles on the road was um, outstripping the speed that the infrastructure was growing. But it does seem in the last six months that the pace of the infrastructure growth has really stepped up. Um, so I'm optimistic we'll see, um, we'll see the infrastructure keeping pace. Um, but what about drivers who haven't switched over to electric vehicles? Um, why? What are the barriers? What's preventing them from doing that? And how can those barriers be addressed? Naturally, I think the, the, the largest feedback we hear is cost of change. Um, I said there has been a lot of recent announcements with um, ultra low emissions. Um, especially in inner city areas such as London, that that clearly is helping um, helping um, ad address those those costs. But um, in, initially, from a lot of conversations we start off with, it's, it's around the, in, the inevitable upfront capital cost of going with this transition. Um, we often hear range anxiety. I think um, that's often a, a big concern. Um, and really it's about again linking back to that first that's my sort of first answer in, in, the, in the first question around um making sure that the user profile for each vehicle for each vehicle or fleet is 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 closely assessed there has to be has to be that holistic review um it's about it's about putting the right um the right vehicles in the right a application the right demand but also the, the, the driver has the, the the actual end drivers have to have some input into that as well because um if, if it's not careful, there has to be a, there has to be an element of driver buy-in um, about how how they how they drive the vehicle, how they how they recharge at home. It, it's it's all important points that need to be added into the into the whole review. Yeah, I agree. And you mentioned range, Chris, um, and presumably uh, when we're talking about fully electric vehicle, if it also has quite high demands in auxiliary power, that range comes under even more pressure. Absolutely. Um, I, I, I suppose in in traditional um, ice vehicles, we would be able to harvest energy or power from from the from the main engine alternator, for example. Um, but as as companies and and fleets are transitioning across to EV, we clearly don't have that no. um, that power takeoff available. So um, it, it, it's cases like this that we've worked with um, quite some quite high profile customers on um, transitioning uh, them across to more greener ways of storing and creating power. Um, for example, um, our, our work with ITV and ITN and also broadcast companies like Sky, for example, that um, the, these the, these vehicles would traditionally have diesel generators in the back, mm -hmm. um, outputting emissions. And, and now we're able to come up with lithium-based power solutions, um, which which are completely independent from the main, from the main uh, electric drivetrain. Right, I see. Okay, so it's not actually having a direct impact on the range other than potentially additional weight. But that's, uh, yeah, I, I can see that becoming quite a valuable uh, resource. Mm, definitely. Yeah. Um, and uh, the, the other thing I wanted to ask you about, Chris, was the role that government plays in all of this. Um, so um, We've seen some government intervention, um, uh, but what more would you like to see done to support fleet, fleet operators with interim solutions to help them meet their emissions targets? Um, I suppose that question probably is more aimed at a politician rather than, rather than myself. But but it's um, it, my opinion on the matter is is about trying to not not dilute the the um, legislation. I think that's important that there is a clear directive. And a clear, clear stance from 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 government, basically that we have we, we have this we have this um, this goal to achieve, and and um, we we are going to going to get there. It's um, and also as well not ensuring that the, that the early take ups of 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 this um, of the innovation are rewarded and not penalised, mm -hmm. um, and making sure that I suppose the the, the late take up um, fleet fleets or fleet operators. Um, also have also have the ability to be able to um, put a clear pathway in place to to to, to catch up and or, or potentially reach their, their 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 own goals as well. Um, it, it needs a it needs a consistency in policy. I think is is the, is the, is the main driver here. 
Uh, well, I, I couldn't agree with you more, Chris. Um, we're, we're, we're at the moment, I think we're in a fairly precarious uh, uh, position where there have been some suggestions that uh, policy may change, but um, that's not what businesses need and it's not what fleets need. They need the confidence to know that they're making the right decision in a timely fashion. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, well, Chris, I'd like to thank you very much for your insight today. It's been a pleasure talking to you. No problem at all. Thank, thank you very much for your time, Kate. Thank you. Uh, that is about all we've got time for. So thank you to Fisher Panda for joining Green Flute Talks and thank you for watching. Please tune in to GF365 again soon.